this one here for me. So a little bit more about himself and his career, but I think it's it's really um, fascinating. I'm looking forward very much to hearing what you have to say. So over to you, Charles. Thanks very much, Jenny. Uh, and thanks, Nicole and UQ SIP for the invitation. I'm uh, very happy to be able to come share my research and meet all of you. Um, yeah, give a bit more of a background. So my parents, my dad's English and mum's from Kiribati, uh, but I grew up in the Solomons. And mum, she was relocated by the British when she was very young from Phoenix Island. And so I have connections. Um, a lot of family live in the Western province and Wagina. Um, yeah, I think these sort of opportunities I really relish being able to particularly share my research with, with those uh, based at research institutes or those who have put family, you know, personal connections or passion uh, regarding Solomon Islands and sort of Oceania. So I'm very thankful to be able to uh, have this opportunity. Uh, of course, I've, uh, oh, and I'll just touch this uh, image of Manning Strait. So I'm in a plane over Wagina, uh, this area here, and I believe that's Nikomororo, but some of the villages, main villages, are down this way. Um, so before I continue, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. Uh, we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. So I'll give a brief outline. Everyone see there? Um, so I'll be give a background to Solomon Islands prehistory. Um, and this will just provide an important context to think about how my research uh, started. And I'll give an outline of my research aims, methodology. Um, and then I'll share some of the findings from the field work. So uh, field work took place between mid 2016, early 2019. And um, I'll be focusing on three sites. There was a lot of sites I, I looked at, but these were some of the more detailed studies. Um, so the first is an intertidal ceramic site, so basically a scatter of pottery um, found in northwest Isabel, and it's likely to date to over 2,000 years. And then the next two sites are located in the Arnavan Islands and uh, in southeast Choisel. And these, uh, the first one, in Sikopo, is inland ceramic site. Uh, so a few of us have actually been to the Arnavans, which is cool. Uh, I'll be able to provide uh, some more detail about what we found there. And uh, Lina Islands, uh, a primarily unoccupied island in southeast Choiseul. There's a, uh, a village, small village called Rocoso, uh, Southern Day uh, Adventist SDA community. Uh, they, based on the mainland, and they generally go fishing and use uh, this island for copper production. Uh, but there's some really interesting shrine complexes on the island, so I'll talk about them. A major component of my study was looking at pottery. So I'll talk about some stylistic and compositional uh, findings from the analysis of the pottery. And near the end, I'll give sort of like a revised cultural sequence for the Western Solomon. So just thinking about, you know, these long-term changes um, and what we're seeing from the archeological record. Uh, I'll touch on Manning Strait as a dynamic seascape. And what I mean by that is thinking about how early in time, it seems to have facilitated a lot of movement of pottery and chert and people, whereas in the last thousand years, this seems to change uh, to become quite sort of contested. And I'll, so I'll, I'll go into that a bit more detail. And finally, I'll share some sort of personal and career goals. And I think that's really important in these sort of settings to be able to share what it is, why it is I'm doing this, what I'm interested in. Um, all right, so as we all know, uh, Solomon Islands population of about 700,000 and spread across a thousand islands. Uh, very linguistically diverse, about 80 languages spoken. Uh, 20 of these, most of them are non Austronesian, based in the Northern Solomon, so Buka Bougainville, uh, and the rest of the languages in main Solomon Islands are predominantly Austronesian. And these languages originate from around sort of Southeast Asia, Taiwan area, and they represent uh, most of the sort of speakers in Solomon Islands. We also have Polynesian outliers. Uh, spoken as and Polynesian languages spoken as well and Micronesian mums from there. Um, so to provide a bit of context um, on that divide, I've just highlighted a line, and that's really important in in archaeological research, thinking about this gap between near Oceania and remote Oceania. So remote Oceania uh, refers to sort of 
more sequestered, isolated islands in uh, this part of the Pacific. And then when you west of that border, oh, so this imaginary divide, which is just east of Makira, um, a lot of the islands are intervisible. So voyaging becomes a little more, becomes easier. Um, and so this is, Solomon Islands plays a very important role and is situated in a pivotal uh, geographic area, uh, looking at people's uh, migrations into this part of the world. So provide a bit of context in uh, late 90, 1990s and early 2000s, some prominent archeologists were uh, arguing that Solomon Islands is one of the least well understood regions in the Pacific. And, you know, my job wasn't to prove them wrong, but certainly over the last 20 years, this is, this is changing, I believe. So a lot of work done by one of my f former supervisors, Professor Richard Walter, uh, and a good time uh, friend, and a long time friend and colleague of his, Peter Shepard, based at University of Auckland. Uh, they've been showing that, you know, there's a lot of work being done in the Western Solomons, particularly in the New Georgia group, that is sort of changing this narrative. So part of my research was to try, you know, build upon that, uh, changing that narrative. All right, so here's a, a more zoomed in map of Solomon Islands. And this sort of cultural geographic split or regionalization of the Solomons is mainly based on uh, my supervisor, Peter Shepard's work. But um, it's, a, it's a sort of uh, helpful way in terms of looking at the archeological record of this area, Western Solomons. Uh, so this is Manning Strait here, located uh, between uh, Southeast Chorizo and Northwest Isabel. And I'll just touch on uh, an archaeological sequence put forward by Walter and Shepard, and they've got a good, uh, almost like a textbook uh, on the archaeology of the Solomon Islands. They published at the University of Otago in 2017. In it, they put forward sort of four periods to characterize this uh, sort of human prehistory in the area beginning with the late Lapita period. So this is from the archeological evidence. Um, so people arriving around sort of 2,700 years ago, they argue, and mainly using pottery and, and settling on the coast. Uh, then they de describe an aceramic period. So this is really much a sort of gap in our understanding as to what's happening in prehistory. Um, there's few archeological sites that date to within that time frame. And also importantly, they argue that pottery making appears to cease in the New Georgia group from around 2000 years ago. And then finally, in the last thousand years, you have two periods, Bao and Raviana period. And these are names of some of the uh, types of shrines that were began to be constructed and built around from that, in, the, in that time. So aim of my research was to try to build upon this. Uh, to give some more context about the archeological sites, so, the red squares, they represent uh, very old aceramic sites. So we generally would say sort of pre-Lapita, um, but really they go back to as, as early as about 30,000 years ago. So that's the earliest known site, archeological site in sort of Solomon Islands area. And it's Kilo Cave in, in Booker. Um, and that was investigated by Stephen Wickler as part of his PhD in the mid 1990s. Uh, and there's several other sites uh, one of the more well-known ones, Poha Cave in Guadalcanal, investigated by David Rowe as part of his PhD in the 90s as well. And in more recent years, there's been some really interesting work being uh, led by Johannes Moser, German archaeologist, around sort of small Malaita area. And this site, it's a like a chert, uh, flaking floor site, dates to around so 2,100 years ago. So they've been having some really interesting finds and burials uh, in that area. And also, some work done in northern Makira. It's a coastal site dates to around 3,000 years ago. And interestingly, no pottery, because uh, that was quite an interesting find, because uh, generally sites dating to around that period, you may uh, imagine that they're, you're gonna be finding pottery coming up. And I've added this one. This was found as part of my study on Wagina. It's a cave site dates to around 2,300 years ago. So just an understanding as to uh, sort of distribution of sites uh, of these earlier ones. And then these green circles represent uh, Lapida coastal sites. So I've just put up two up near Buka and on Sahano Island, um, and these are predominantly, uh, they have a lot of dentate stamp pottery, and um, it's particularly um, connected with this migration of people, Lapida peoples arriving into this part of the Pacific. Um, so 
when you, you contrast it to the lapidocytes, you have so the yellow stars, uh, they represent what appears to be like a delayed migration of people into this part of the solmas. So the pottery is very different. It's not dentate stand. It's primarily incised and impressed. And I'll show a few examples of what I mean in terms of the decoration. So there the rectangle highlights Manning Strait again. And I just added another star because it's one of the sites I'll talk about. Was It's another late Lapita site, uh, which I was really happy with our team that we were able to find. And to give some insight into pottery exchange patterns, uh, the Western Solomons, we, there's been quite a lot of pottery found. It doesn't get probably as much tension as sites such as in more recently, like Tuma and Vanuatu, uh, places in Papua New Guinea where you're having thousands and thousands of pieces of pottery. But we're still able to build up quite a good understanding of people's mobility and interaction in the Western Solomons through the movement of pottery. So those sites, uh, pottery assemblages from them have been analyzed uh, using different techniques, and they provide a bit of insight into people's uh, interaction. So in the New Georgia group, it appears early in time, the late Lapita period, people were making pottery locally, you know, using resources uh, near them and then uh, exchanging with one another. There's also clear evidence of very long distance movement of pottery, you know, over hundreds of kilometers uh, across the Solomon Sea. More recently, a few studies of Argued it's coming from Muyu Island in the Lusiad archipelago. There's also some evidence of a few bits of pottery found on Bellona, which were made on New in the New Georgia group. So again, very long distances. And then over time, you're seeing that there's an importation of pottery from Choisel into the New Georgia group, as well as across Manning Strait uh, into Isabel. Uh, I'll mention Booker pottery and Booker's uh, quite well known for its uh, quite large scale pottery production in the area and there's some movement also from uh, Booker all the way to Ongtong Java so I'm just highlighting some of the, the trends and movements of pottery and then in the Bougainville Strait which is not far from where I've done my study in the last thousand years there's a known record of, of, of pottery movement in that area and basically like an explosion of sort of cultural interaction of people moving warfare that took place from around the last thousand years so yeah, my study was aimed to think, okay, well, if I'm gonna find pottery in the Manning Strait region, how does it fit into this, uh, sort of what we know already? Oh, that was an accident. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, and I'll just touch on the last thousand years. This was a particularly important time, I believe, for the Western Solomons, because you had the emergence of shrine construction from around 800 years, and then uh, headhunting began about so 500 years ago. And this intensified following uh, arrival of Europeans and particularly with the introduction of highly sought after like iron tomahawks, guns, uh, so forth. So heads in this tradition were seen as sources of mana and wealth. Um, so some of the greatest impacted areas in the Western Songs were Northwest Isabel and parts of Southeast Choisel and Roviana in particular were particularly dominant. Um, so you also see a lot of production uh, an intensification in the production and exchange of shell valuables. So that's some of the images you're seeing, as well as uh, a large war canoe. So a lot of our knowledge about this last this time period, the last thousand years, has comes from archaeological, ethnographic, historic work that's been done uh, in the Western, in the New Georgia group in particular. So I wanted to ask, well, what can we learn from the archaeological record of Manning Strait? So my research aims, the first was to devise and build upon the archaeological sequence for the Western Solomons. And this importantly would provide a spatial and temporal foundation upon which I could answer further questions. The second was to investigate the nature, extent and development over time of prehistoric trade and exchange systems. And that's where this uh, ceramic analysis played a major component. And the third is to assess the role Manning Strait played in hindering or fostering interaction between communities to examine how this may influence cultural development in the region. Uh, so that this question was aimed to broaden the scope of my study and to, um, <clears throat> to think about how uh, Manning Strait, the environment, is, may have influenced sort of uh, cultural development in the region. And central to this, uh, <clears throat> and sorry, the, the Manning Strait is provided agency by having this sort of question and, and thinking about uh, assessing what acted as barriers or may have helped facilitate intercommunal interaction in the region. 
So to touch on my theoretical framework, um, near the start of my PhD, I didn't really know what to do, you know, as I think any PhD student. But I, one of the first things I did was drew from some major studies of straits that have been done in the Pacific, and there are several. Uh, so one of the ones I drew from was uh, work done by Jeff Irwin and John Terrell in Bougainville Strait area. So in Bougainville Strait, they, they took primarily sort of spatial and ecological approaches to looking at the archaeological record and historical record. In Vitya Strait, Ian Lilly from UQ, he, for his PhD, he took a fundamentally cultural historical approach and he placed a lot of emphasis looking at uh, prehistoric trade and exchange models. In more recent years, in Torres Strait, Ian McNiven has taken a but alternative approach, looking at um, the archaeological record more from a landscape or seascape uh, frame, frame of mind. So for my study, I aim to combine the sort of traditional cultural historical approach, which has been taken by many before me in the Solomons, including Roger Green, my supervisor, uh, and so forth, and combining it with a more of a sort of landscape approach. And that's really been influenced in the last sort of 15, 20 years with the uh, development of island archaeology. And this places greater emphasis on various scales of interaction between island communities as opposed to their degree of isolation from one another. Um, so I touch on some of these concepts, seascapes, cultural sequences, and also another concept called communities of practice. And if you're unfamiliar with the term, so rather than thinking about like ethnic groups, cultural groups, which is very often, often done in archaeology, uh, you can separate the sort of ethnic groups and think about communities of practice. So in the Western Solomon, some of those practices I mentioned, uh, head unseen shrine construction, that crossed the barriers, you know, it wasn't just done in the Western province or just by Roviana. Uh, so thinking about how that influenced sort of regional uh, identities forming. All right, so the methodology was a three-pronged approach. The first was by far the, the funnest part, was the field research, involved a lot of survey excavation work, about uh, just over five months uh, in the area. And part of it also involved uh, documenting oral histories. Uh, this wasn't a primary focus of my field work, but certainly when occasions arose, generally when I was talking about what we were finding or asking permission, uh, oral stories would be, uh, would be shared. Uh, laboratory analysis, there were several different types. A uh, big component was looking at the pottery. So thinking about the styles, uh, so thinking about like, the shape of the vessels, what type of decoration, um, and also using a machine, and I'll get to that a bit later. And then we also did geochemical characterization of uh, some uh, the stone tools, specifically a bit of obsidian or volcanic glass, which we found in the ornaments. And I examined some shell tool and ornaments and carried out some analysis on the faunal or the animal remains that will uh, digging up uh, in the area. Another important part of my thesis was uh, reviewing uh, ethnographic and historical literature. So the image you see is a uh, Google image of, uh, satellite image, sorry, of, of Manning Strait. So I'll be talking about these three sites. Uh, firstly, Papatura, and then Sikopo and Lina Island. And before I get to them, I'll just give a general overview of the field work. Uh, so really important I highlight it was a very much a collaborative effort. Um, I worked closely with the Solomon Islands National Museum and uh, some of their field archaeologists. They, they don't have too many, but one of them who's in the photo here, Grinta Aleke Vibama. Um, she, to my knowledge, is the only uh, qualified and practicing female archaeologist in at least working for the museum. So it's great having her on board. Um, and I worked closely with the Santa Isabel Provincial Office and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, they have a lot of rangers who, who live seasonally on the Arnavan Islands, so they were able to assist with the field work. And some of them in the photo, that's Tolliver in the middle. Um, <clears throat> so it involved five field seasons between 2016 and 2019, and very happy resulted in the recording of close to 40 sites. Some other significant outcomes, the discovery of one of only two late Lapita sites that have been found in Northwest Isabel. Uh, there's about there's over 20 have been found in the new georgia group and there's very similar settings that you can find in northwest isabel so it's likely there may be more but i'll touch on uh it's been really hard hard hit this part of isabel uh, with like shore recession and uh, impacts of uh, sort of coastal impacts uh, also resulted in uh, we found a very early or early cave site on wagina which we were happy about dated to around 2300 years ago as well as finding a stratified or like layered ceramic deposits 
Unfortunately, they're, they're rare in the Western Solomons. There's been work done there since the mid-90s, but we haven't, there hasn't been much luck with finding buried deposits because mainly they're on the coast in mangrove, you know, highly disturbed deposit uh, areas. So we're really happy with some of those findings. All right, so the first site, Papatura Ite. Uh, there's a resort on the island, a beautiful island. And my family were just there very last weekend because uh, my one of my older sisters celebrated her 30th birthday. And they, so they were there. Um, and really great for me because when I've been there, there's, a, there's archaeology on the island as well. Uh, so sort of dream paradise for myself. Um, so it, this is the site here. So this is the island Papatura and there's the mainland Isabel. And the resort's a bit further south. But um, so we found over 400 piece, pieces of pottery, some stone tools, uh, triacna shell chisel, and we have given this site slightly date to over 2,000 years. And this is based on comparing the decoration and styles of the pottery to what's to known and dated sites in Roviana. Um, so there are very strong resemblances between some of the pottery. Um, and this part of Isabel has been particularly hit, and there's a very extensive evidence of uh, severe shore recession. Um, so it, I, I argue the stilt village in the area is likely to have extended out probably near to the low tide mark, but we were finding a lot of the pottery there and upstream. Uh, but yeah, it was really, and we just sort of stumbled on it. I was working with one of the uh, men who works at the resort, and I found what looked like a bit of pottery, and we returned there, and we're finding a lot more, some of it very beautifully intricate, uh, decorated, and I'll show you some examples. All right, in the Arnavan Islands, the second site, and here's a map showing some of the islands, so it's one of four, and the red star indicates the, where the archaeological activity was based. So prior to uh, work done by my supervisor, who has ongoing work there with the Nature Conservancy, and before the start of my PhD, in mid sort of 2016, uh, we didn't really know much about the archaeological record of, of the islands, although in ethnographic and historical records, it's well known how uh, a lot of communities prize them for the turtle and hunting grounds. Uh, ecologically very significant as the largest rookery of Hawksbill turtle in the South Pacific. Uh, so this is where my fieldwork started, and I'll show you one of the excavations. Um, so just, well, this is a section, a drawing from of, of this excavation. So this excavation was a three by three meter square, the largest excavation as part of my field research. And um, basically we dug it down to about a meter or so, and then we draw one of the walls, and this gives us indication as to try and identify change over time in terms of the layers and changes in soil types and what you're finding. Uh, so it contained a lot of pottery, uh, a lot of shellfish thrown away, had been eaten, and um, so I'll just highlight, we found, identified two features. So um, <clears throat> this one is basically just like heaps of shell and I don't have a photo up, but you can just imagine if you're looking this, at this from bird's eye down into the pit, it's basically just heaps of, of a lot of trochus and giant clamshell. And then below that, it seemed like a possible floor, floor surface because when we we're scraping it, it just became very compact. And it's likely that the coral beneath it, which is there, very likely to be natural. People, if possibly just tr uh, trampling over it over time, becomes very compact. Uh, but the great thing is we're able to extract charcoal samples from some of these features um, and from the different layers and provide an understanding of, you know, when were these, when was the charcoal burnt, how long ago were people there. So it indicated two phases of occupation, some of the dating. So the first dates around eight to 700 years ago, and then the, the second, between 600 to sort of 500 years ago. Um, so quite later in time than Papatura, remember I was saying it's about 2000 years, uh, the site may be that old. So this one's in the last sort of millennium. And interestingly, we found one piece of volcanic glass, obsidian, and it's, it's very rare to find in the Western Solomons. It's, it's the size of your fingernail, and Grinta, that archeologist I mentioned from the museum, picked it out of a sieve. And the really great thing about obsidian is that uh, it provides a very geochemically distinct signature that you can compare to known volcanic sources elsewhere in the Pacific. So we were able to source it to an um, uh, obsidian source called Kutabao, which is in uh, West New Britain, and that's over 900 kilometers away. Uh, you know, huge distance. Uh, interestingly, a lot of archaeologists spend a lot of time looking at this type of stone. Um, we expected the obsidian to be from a different source. We thought it might come from the Admiralties, because generally you're finding that uh, 
obsidian that comes from Kutabao is uh, usually around the Lapita time, so 3,000 years ago. So it was an interesting find, but nonetheless, you know, it doesn't revolutionize anything. It's just basically, it's likely the obsidian was passed down through down the line exchange. Around the last thousand years, there's evidence of a lot of buildup of intensifications of um, exchange networks located around sort of uh, East New Britain, uh, connecting with sort of Nissan to Bougainville and Booker. So it's likely the um, obsidian flake has made its way a very long way down to the Andamans. All right, the next, uh, the third site is Lina Island. And I was very happy to be able to do some work on Lina Island. And how we ended up uh, being invited there was one of the rangers I worked with on the Anavans. He's uh, one of the landowners there. And he was noticing we we're looking at pottery, some shrine sites. And he was like, there's some on my island. And I he was like, well, do you guys want to include it? And I was, of course, um, delighted to be able to. Uh, so I'll talk about two sites and I'll mention so after we were invited, we, I did a bit of reading, and as one of Choi's first native medical doctor's uh, officers, he wrote, he had written a little bit about Lion Island, and he described it as possible like a birthplace, so, you know, place of origin of people in Choi's, because there's a lot of high stone walls and look like old looking ruins there. Um, so it did definitely sound like there were shrines there. And yeah, so we wanted to be able to carry out work on the island. And after we'd established permissions with the whole community there, uh, we, I'll, I'll touch on two sites we looked at, one in the south and one in the north. So, um, and that's Lion Island, obviously there. So quite a mountainous, quite high island, different to some of the lower lying atolls in the area. And <clears throat> so the first site was a large rectangular coral slab formation. And if we can imagine we're standing there, it'd be about the size of this room, and it consisted of about like 12 large coral slabs some of these were huge, you know, weighing upwards of 200 kilos or so. Um, so it required a real big organized communal effort. And um, the photo you can see in the top right, so that's one of the chiefs from the village. He's standing next to one of the coral slabs where we dug an excavation. Uh, so we were finding some fresh coral had been dumped at the base of these slabs in the construction. And on the surface and in some of the excavations, we were finding pottery fragments. Uh, stone tools, shell valuables, mainly tridac marines, and thrown away shellfish. So we thought there might be a burial, you know, you think highly ceremonial these areas. We, we dug a few test bits in the middle of the formation. Uh, we didn't really come across any burials, but uh, in a, on a mound nearby the site, we found it looked like a part of a human tibia. So there's certainly human bone there. And, um, excuse me, we can definitely say it's very, you know, sacred site but um, it would require further investigations to be able to learn more about um, some of the activities that took place there. So we were able to date some of the charcoal we found on a bit of pottery in on the excavations, and that shows the, the structure is most likely built around 600 years ago. Um, so quite early, um, in terms of how it connects to shrine construction and the known sort of traditions in the New Georgia group, it very much fits in roughly with that, that time period. But it's, a bit sort of early in terms of the style of, of the shrine. And the second site, which is located in the far north of the island, um, a really, a very large, very impressive uh, sort of walled structure. So it consisted of an outer wall, uh, basically just large bits of coral piled up, but as much as a meter and high art, um, 1.5 meters high. And so it's outer wall facing the coast and then um, an inner wall which seemed to be sort of like protecting this Apu Seva hill. And in oral history, this particular part of the island is, is sacred. There's a cliff face facing out to a coral reef. And they said there's oral stories of like a red shark, which had traveled up this road, this coral road. And um, it's just sort of interesting to provide that sort of uh, oral historical context. Um, so we dug a few test bits there and found a really wide range of artifacts, uh, a lot of pottery, grindstones, we found some quartz fragments and in the archaeological record across the Western Solomons, it's not particularly common quartz. Um, and it appears for this site, it was highly specialized in that people were using, uh, grinding the quartz down to create like an abrasive paste. And that was then used in the grinding of shell to speed up the process. So, and um, we were confident about that because in some of the writings from that Guso Pico, the other man I mentioned, he's described how in, uh, in early 1900s, people were using uh, that type of paste in, in the process. So it was really interesting. 
and the site dates to between 450 to 150 years ago. Um, all right, now just to touch on some of the pottery. So I've got two images, one's of pottery from Papatur, the very early site, and then on the left, and then on the right is pottery probably dates to within the last thousand years. So that's pottery from Wagina, Anaban Islands, um, Lina Island. So there was clear distinctions between the styles of the pottery. So you're noticing like wavy or, or sort of uh, pinched rims in the uh, Papatura pottery. Um, a lot of the vessel shapes were like sort of highly carinated or shouldered and were out curving. Um, there's fingernail impression. So it was quite distinctive. And then in the last thousand years, this appears to change. So generally there's a trend of simplification in the, in the pottery, in the, in the forms of decoration and in the vessel forms. So that did appear to be the case. Um, so there's a few examples there you can see of uh, different techniques, incision and impression. And I'll highlight these two lower uh, examples. And these are sort of characteristics or classic examples of pottery made in Suravanga in Northwest Choizal, where today there's still maybe just less than a handful of women who know the sort of, uh, still know the tradition. They don't actively practice it, but they, they know that uh, they have, um, they are potters. Yeah, so the, these were found on Wagina and are likely to date within the sort of last 200 years. So for the compositional part of the analysis, um, which is a very lengthy process, I analyzed about 96 samples and that involved basically cutting little bits of the pottery, preparing it into epoxy plugs and then putting it into this, what looks like a large desktop computer. So that uh, SEM, scanning electron microscope, provides a highly magnified uh, image of the mineralogy of the pottery, so that little piece of pottery. And it also, you can zap and you can get uh, geochemical profiles of the of the types of minerals and identify the types of minerals. So this is an example of, of one of the map scans that can be produced from the pottery and examples of some of the minerals identified. So this particular shirt, bit of pottery, which we found on a shrine on in the Arnavan Islands, was quite distinctive from the other ones as it contain, contained olivine. Uh, olivine is just, you find it in basaltic rock. It's not, you know, like a holy grail sort of mineral, but it's um, interesting that because none of the other pottery I looked at contained it. So it was comparing this particular bit of pottery, its mineralogy to other studies that have been done in Roviana, it appeared clear that uh, it's likely that the shirt came from the Roviana. So they were able to get an understanding of people's movement of pottery. So the process involved basically looking at the bit of pottery, comparing it to geological maps and previous ceramic studies, as well as our own analysis of some of the sand samples. And a few findings from the compositional study. So it appears that early in time, people were sort of uh, quite used, quite freely used the resources around them to make the pottery. So like white beach sands, for example, and Papatura, a lot of it was made with white beach sands. But generally you find in the last thousand years, uh, technologically, they're, they're really just focusing on the use of volcanic beach sands and stream sands. And they're generally finer. Uh, you produce usually harder and more resilient pottery. Uh, so that was an interesting find, and generally uh, there's, there's evidence of a sort of contraction of exchange networks. So particularly in the last thousand years, you've seen that uh, not only, you remember how I was mentioning there was very long distance movement of pottery, in the last thousand years it seems to be sort of shrinking in. Um, the Choizal, oops, Choizal appears to become a real dominant centre in pottery production in the last thousand years. And that's been highlighted to an extent in previous literature in the sense that we found pottery that looks very likely to be made in, in Choizal. And uh, the late William Dickinson, a uh, um, geologist who's worked very closely and for a long time with archaeologists, uh, he has sourced some of or characterized some of the pottery you find in the New Georgia group to Choizal. But through my study, what was a great outcome was able to just provide some greater resolution, you know, high resolution to our understanding of, of where the pottery was being made and where it was moving to. All right, and I'll touch on, uh, sort of like summarize some of the findings from, from the study and thinking about in this very sort of long-term or big picture. So this image here from my thesis, uh, I've divided it up as color schemes representing the different time periods. Um, you know, so it's sort of like a rough way of, of, of being able to sort of um, try condense and understand and better frame our understanding of, of uh, these long-term changes. 
So we'll start with the pre-Lupita phase. So that's basically prior to the arrival of these pottery using peoples. Unfortunately, there's no, nothing yet in the archaeological record we found that dates to that time period uh, in the Western Solomons. Uh, but certainly linguistically, there's evidence of people uh, being there in the past, non austronesian languages, remnants of them still being in the Western Solomons. Uh, so, and then you have the late Lapita phase, where you have the arrival of pottery using and highly interactive coastal dwelling communities. So I was able to, we've found that uh, site in Northwest Isabel, which I was real happy about. And this was demonstrating movements of pottery as well as stone tools specifically chert, a type of stone that's quite common in Northwest Isabel. Um, so movements across Manning Strait. When we reached this aceramic phase, again, so none of the sites I was investigating, unfortunately they didn't um, fall into that time period. So we still don't really know much about what's happening during that time, but I argue it's probably some intermixing going on between um, the arriving coastal communities and already resident, but also probably quite small uh, populations of non-Australian speakers uh, in the Western Solomons. And it'd be a really interesting um, sort of avenue to explore, but really it's just sort of, I'm just throwing ideas out there at the moment. And, and finally, in the last thousand years, I'll highlight again just how important a time it was for the Western Solomons. Uh, we're seeing these major cultural developments, such as headhunting, shrine construction, intensification of shell uh, production and exchange. And Touching on that communities of practice concept that I mentioned, so regional identities appear to be really sort of strengthening around that time. And it's, I would argue it's very likely to be, and others have argued before me, that it's, argued, um, it's likely to be from the intensified interaction uh, and gradual development of these communally shared practices. And another great outcome is, yeah, we have a great understanding of the movement production of pottery and during that time period. But certainly there's still considerable gaps in our knowledge. So that's a good thing in one way so we can keep doing more research um, but I'll just highlight my research you know hasn't completely transformed what we know about the Western Solomons it's very much just building on from what has been done before me um, but certainly opening up new doors in terms of thinking about what what else can we learn about our, our distant past in this part of the Solomons and just touching on that dynamic seascape sort of uh, outlook of the Manning Strait so as I highlighted it appears that in the late Lapita period, it seems very much it's an ocean uh, open highway, you know, ocean highway. So it seems like there's movement of pottery going back and forth, um, a chert moving across Manning Strait, but this definitely changes over time. So in late prehistory, uh, on the last thousand years, it becomes it appears to become a highly contested seascape. So there's certainly it was fostering a, a different type of interaction, mainly warfare. Uh, but it also represented a barrier. You know, I mentioned Northwest Isabel and Southeast Joyza were some of the hardest hits area. Uh, Roviana headhunters were traveling up into Manning Strait to the Anamans and sort of uh, spreading out from there. And this sort of change in it becoming a more of a contested seascape is uh, represented or supported in an archaeological record by some headhunting sites, uh, burial sites. I haven't shown any images, but there's a lot located around Wagina. Um, also in oral histories of Wagner being described as, as a sort of battleground. Um, and then today there's sort of like a remnant or a testament of this sort of development in the last thousand years is uh, today Roviana communities, people in Kia, Northwest Isabel and parts of Southeast Choisel, they all have contest claims of ownership of Arnhem Islands. So I think this is sort of like a yeah, testament to this development of, of Manning Strait becoming really highly contested in the, in the last thousand years. And to finish, I'll just share a few sort of personal goals. And I've, I've just listed a few publications, one of which I'm working on at the moment, and I'm happy to be able to share uh, some of these, the work I've been doing. Um, and so I'll just touch on a few sort of uh, goal, as, goals and aspirations, one of which is greater dialogue and multilateral cooperation between grassroots communities, research bodies, and people such as ourselves. So an important part of that process is strengthening ties between overseas research institutions and Solomon Islands communities, uh, government bodies, particularly um, uh, work very closely with the Solomon Islands National Museum. So I definitely want to strengthen that as well as educational hubs. And I'm very happy to know uh, UQSIP has a MOU with uh, SINU. So I think it's really important. I think it's important about trying to continue those, those ties. 
and possibly for me if I'm uh, be working in New Zealand or be based elsewhere, I definitely want to be try continue to uh, keep those connections and, and build some new ones. So um, another important goal is to engage Solomon Islands public. You know, I've spent uh, close to 40 minutes talking about what I've done over the last eight years. But at the end of the day in Solomon Islands, you ask someone what archaeology is and they'll say, I don't know. Um, so a big part of that is just trying to improve education awareness around archaeology. Um, already, when you speak to a lot of communities, particularly the older generations, they know so much about their tumble sites or their ancestral sites, and they have a deep sense of care uh, for their history. But it's a matter of trying to inf influence or uh, tell that and show that to the government and, and NGOs and research bodies to try to think about ways of continuing to conserve uh, our cultural heritage. So I'm definitely interested in a wide range of avenues of exploring that, you know, radio talks or booklets, uh, influencing curriculum, and also pressuring the government to adopt adopt more robust legislative protection for its indigenous cultural heritage. And I was very happy to be involved the last couple of months uh, with Craig and uh, several others on uh, a project uh, run by partly by UNESCO and the Solomon Islands Ministry of Culture and Tourism. They want to ratify the UNESCO's 2001 uh, Convention on Underwater Cultural Heritage. So, you know, it makes sense. It'll, it'll protect a lot of the World War II sites. So obviously a lot of World War II uh, sites in the area, but importantly, it will have some protection for some of the coastal sites, you know, that I've, I've talked about, headhunting sites that do get un inundated. Um, so I was really pleased to be able to be invited to take part in that panel and. Um, hopefully be able to just continue on with some of, some of that work. Um, so yeah, that's basically yeah, it for my talk. Uh, a lot of people to thank, but I'll just mention particularly my my supervisors, former supervisors, Richard Walter and Glenn Summerhays. And thank you, Tomas, thank you, UQSIP, for the opportunity. And I look forward to being able to uh, stay in touch with you and think of ways of strengthening ties um, with the Solomon Islands. So thanks very much. Thank you.